I'm very, very proud to present our veterinarian. His name is Dr. Craig Kulikowski, and he is the head of equine sports medicine of Saratoga Springs, New York, in Wellington, Florida. What is so wonderful about Craig, and he's spoken at all three summits and also at the International Equine Conference in 2012, 2013, 12. 2012. Yeah, um, he is openly anti-slaughter, always has been, and it's one of the reasons that I'm so happy that he's our vet, because we all have dealt with vets that are pro-slaughter, and a lot of that has just been because of the positions, the <coughs> pathetic positions of the AAEP and the AVMA, which we hope over time will change. But it's going to take vets like Craig and others to finally step forward and say, this is not why I became a vet. This is not where, what we're all about. And so I'm very pleased to present Craig Kulikowski, who is going to be speaking about this very important subject. Craig. Okay, thanks Susan. That was a very kind uh, introduction. Um, thanks for inviting me again. Um, sorry that uh, I'm just getting here. I. I uh, have been very busy this weekend uh, with um, emergencies and uh, things going uh, <clears throat> somewhat wrong. So, uh, but uh, finished up the laceration in time to get here, and um, hopefully my phone doesn't ring while I'm. Uh, I should have a voicemail, but I'm going to ignore that for a minute. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about course guardianship rights and responsibilities. Um, I'm glad that. We have a summit now that is um, not just talking about ending slaughter. Um, we've made some progress, and I, I think we need to look past that and, and start to deal with the next step, hopefully, um, down for, for down the road for these horses. I'd um, like to thank the American Equine Summit. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, a lot of this is, gonna, is my opinion. Uh, you know, there will be some facts and laws and things that I talk about here, uh, and there's going to be a lot of people that disagree, but I'm, I'm going to try to make it as logical as I can so that it makes sense. Um, and at the end, if there's questions, um, you know, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Uh, I believe that horses have rights and that humans have responsibilities, um, and I believe that summits like this um, bring together like-minded individuals uh, to help turn our human responsibilities into horses' rights and potentially even, you know, laws. Um, with the help of people like Susan Wagner and Victoria McCullough and a lot of other people, of course, um, the current administration has seen the right of horses not to be inhumanely slaughtered in this country uh, for now. And, uh, you know, I believe and hope that maybe the next legal step for horses will be some level of enforcement of equine population control um, and or responsibility in our breeding practices. Horses rights, okay. Um, animals in, in every state have some legal rights. Different species uh, will have different sets of rights in, in different states. Uh, the companion animals tend to have more legal rights than what we call livestock. Um, and while horses tend to be considered livestock, uh, oftentimes they will have very specific protections that most livestock uh, animals don't have. So they, they, like in New York, for instance, which we'll be talking about later, there'll be very specific rules or laws that horses have that other species don't. Um, there are organizations like the Farm Bureau, and I like to pick on them. Um, <laughs> they, they spend a lot of time and money lobbying to keep human rights distinctly stronger than livestock rights, and it's mostly to protect the human's financial interest, okay? And um, I've been on their website a couple times, and I keep looking for anything on their home page that says anything about welfare of the animals that make livings for all the farmers, but I haven't seen it yet. Maybe they've changed it. I, I'm waiting for them to change it. Uh, so summits like this one, you know, are the voice for the horses uh, who can't hire lobbyists like the Farm Bureau does. Now, luckily, we have some people on our side that can't hire lobbyists these days, so, <laughs> so maybe we're leveling the playing field a little bit. Mm. 
and then there's human responsibilities, okay? Um, and their human responsibility is much less defined than the legal rights that you'll find uh, in the law books. Um, and it's meetings like this uh, with humans like us that will help protect horses <clears throat> and animals from organizations like the Farm Bureau who look simply at animals as a source of revenue. Uh, we must recognize that horses and animals share many of the same physical and emotional struggles that humans have. Um, and while we won't ever be able to convince every person uh, that every animal deserves fair or equal treatment, um, because there are humans that don't even believe that all humans believe fair and equal treatment, um, you know, I, I think that we are on the right side of this issue. And uh, as long as we're on the right side of this issue, I think that, you know, um, we'll we keep moving in the right direction. So horses have rights and humans have responsibilities. Um, New York State, and I'm going to talk mostly about New York because that's where we live, um, and, um, and I'm sure we, you could go through every state and look at different parts of it. Um, but uh, New York State actually has many laws pertaining to the legal rights of animals. Now there's going to be a difference between what I, the law says and what actually gets enforced, so I'm not suggesting that these laws are well enforced or um, everyone's going to have a case where they say, well, I saw someone do this. And, and so I'm not really talking about the enforcement part of this, but just about what's on the books. Because unfortunately, enforcement is, is trickier than just writing the law down on a piece of paper. Um, and uh, so some of these laws are geared to specific species, and I'm going to focus on the laws directed towards equine welfare. And it will, it will include other species because they're in the same laws sometimes. Um, the statutes will be found in Article 26 of the Agricultural Market Laws on Cruelty to Animals. And I'm going to be paraphrasing because a, a lot of it's uh, legal language that, um, you know, hopefully I interpreted correctly and I had to read through them a couple times occasionally to get the gist of it. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase for it. And uh, But it was interesting to read because um, I learned a, a lot actually while I was reading through some of these laws. and. Um, about rights that I didn't realize horses had um, legally, and uh, and it, it sort of um, it, it was an eye-opening experience for me for, from that standpoint. So it it might be worth going back and looking through just to see what what the horses are actually how they're supposed to be treated and, and what's actually on the books. So one of the first ones, um, Article Twenty Six, um, Section Three Fifty One, is prohib prohibition of uh, animal fighting. And um, it's not typically associated with horses. More people obviously think of it with dogs fighting and, and or, um, some other species. But uh, this law prohibits the intraspecies fighting of, of any animal or actually of that animal fighting with humans. Um, so it's not just dogs on dogs, but you can't have humans fighting dogs or humans fighting other species. Um, and I wondered whether this could be considered uh, this law could be considered when you talk about physical abuse of, of horses, you know, where actually beating um, or, you know, engaging a horse in a very strong manner. Um, it does have a, it has a, um, a, a, an interesting clause in it that I don't think was well, is for, it's kind of vague, um, but it, it says it should, this law should not impact normal exhibitions at rodeos. So um, somehow the rodeos get, seem to get a pass on that, and I don't know how much latitude they have when it comes to, you know, putting these exhibitions together. Um, but I thought that was a little concerning, um, and, uh, and I wondered if, what exactly they were referring to, because it didn't say anything past that. Um, and, uh, and I also wondered, too, if putting horses in scenario like auction houses or mass transportations could be considered putting animals in fighting situations. Um, you know, we've all seen the videos or photos or first-hand experience even of animals maimed in overcrowded situations. Um, you know, we also know the average American's disdain for animal fighting. So I wonder if tying these two concepts together might be a powerful image or a deterrent um, for people not really having thought about it. You know, maybe there's no prize, you know, in it, but creating a scenario where, they, where they're outwardly going to fight. I mean, how is that really any different? 
Um, section uh, 353 is overdriving, torturing, and injuring animals. Um, this law prohibits a person from overdriving, overloading, torturing, or cruelly beating or unjustifiably injuring, maiming, mutilating, or killing any animal. <coughs> um, it doesn't matter if the person does this to their own animal or to another's animal. So just because you own the animal doesn't give you the right to do whatever you want to it. Um, and uh, there was a recent case here, uh, and I have a pet peeve against uh, equine tooth floaters, but anyways, mm -hmm. um, there was an equine tooth floater in Connecticut that got arrested. She gave a tranquilizer incorrectly and caused the horse to have a seizure. And uh, she was arrested for cruelty to the animal. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to be cruel to an animal. And, um, and, and this was, I thought this was sort of a, an unusual case. I hadn't seen it applied in this way. And of course, this is Connecticut, not New York. But it was just a, a different approach that I hadn't, even, I hadn't even really thought of before. Um, and this law does have an exemption for research done in labs, as long as the labs are approved by the state commissioner of health. And again, it's very vague. It basically says, oh, if you get this approval, you know, it, it didn't get much more specific than that. So unfortunately, you know, while that law is there, it, it leaves some open ends, obviously, if you run rodeos or labs, I guess. Uh, Section 353, continued overdriving, torturing, and injuring animals. Um, Unfortunately, the law uses words like overdriving and unjustifiably injuring. You know, what does overdriving mean? Or what constitutes unjustifiable? You know, what's overdriving to you may not be to me, or, you know, and so forth. Um, so this is where our responsibility comes into play, not just what the law says. Um, and I believe that the average horse that works for a living gets better care. And that's my experience as a veterinarian. I, I go on to farms and the average horse that gets ridden by the 12 year old girl or the 60 year old mother that, you know, doesn't, has an empty nest now, or mm -hmm. they get good care. Um, and, and I do it with a lot of different farms in a big range. And, and even though like the horses here at Equine Advocates don't get work, they are way above average when it comes to non-working horses in terms of the care that they get. So um, I am a proponent of keeping them working for a living because for the reasons that I have here, um, they get their shots, they get their dental work, they get their feet trimmed or they get shot. And if, if they go lame or they get sore, someone generally cares about it because they want to be able to do something with this horse. Now that's not all perfect, but um, I, I like that horses you know, work for a living. I think it's healthy for them as well. Um, and, but, you know, there's extremes in every situation, of course. And so yet working for a living shouldn't mean suffering for a living, I don't believe. And it shouldn't mean putting horses' lives at risk unnecessarily. unnecessarily. Um, you know, horses can kill themselves or get catastrophically, catastrophically injured on their own without our help. We all know that. We've all seen that. We've all dealt with that. You know, so you know, horses can get hurt. And I don't think it's fair to say that horses that get worked for a living, they're not going to suffer catastrophic injuries ever. Um, or um, you bet even, even get killed sometimes. And even though uh, we all wish that that would never happen, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a, sometimes a fact of life. Um, but it's, I think, you know, that it's, it's our responsibility to minimize those chances, you know, especially if we're employing them to help us earn a living. You know, if we're using these animals to make a living, it doesn't, it, shouldn't it be a cost of doing business to try to, try to keep them healthy and alive and performing well? Okay, section 353, failure to provide proper sustenance. Uh, this prohibits the deprivation uh, of sustenance, uh, food or water. Uh, although that sound, sounds very straightforward, uh, the description is obviously vague and is a cause for concern when everyone's understanding of proper sustenance is different, okay? Um, the law doesn't really give any minimum requirements for emaciated animals, and, you know, just as important, there's no real maximum for obesity um, or overindulging. And because proper sustenance doesn't necessarily mean just too little, okay? And um, there's people often forget that the complications from obesity are oftentimes far worse 
than emaciation. And this is another, this is the next step for us. And in, in Europe and especially the UK, they've been addressing obesity a lot more aggressively than we have. In fact, they, if, I, if I remember correctly, they've actually enforced some, uh, some cruelty cases from obesity. And um, so I think that's interesting and I think it's something that we need to keep in mind that that will be the next step. It's not just not feeding them at all, but the people that, you know, that allow them to get unhealthily over, overweight. Um, and so again, this, this is uh, where human responsibility factors in, because um, we control the access to the horse's sustenance, um, and sometimes humans need training in this, in this respect. Uh, improper sustenance. So this is sort of a, um, this happened years ago. I was called out to a farm. Um, it was a young family that, that had a horse that they said was eating funny. Um, when I got there, they had, you know, they had two large animals, one horse, one cow. And when I inquired how long the horse had been losing weight, um, they replied that they hadn't noticed that the horse was losing weight or that it was skinny. And so I pointed out the ribs and the hip bones and the spine, and then they pointed to the cow. And they said, well, you know, look at the ribs and the hip bones and the spine. And I said, well, I understand that that looks pretty similar, you know, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, horses aren't, aren't cows. They're built a little differently. And, um, and they, they said, they, they appeared not to know the difference. Like, I'm pretty skeptical of most human beings. And so, you know, I, I, try, I was trying to read them. And it seemed like they, they really, like I was surprising them, I guess. Um, so in that case, it's kind of an easy fix, right? I can say, well, listen, next time you drive out the road and you pass other horses on the road, and you see what they look like, like that's what your horse might ought to look like as well. <laughs> so sometimes it's just a matter of saying something along those lines so that you know they wake up a little bit, you know. Um, section 353A is aggravated cruel to animals. Um, so this is a law that uh, it, it considers a person is considered guilty of aggravated cruelty to animals when it when with no justifiable purpose, again, um, he or she intentionally kills or intentionally causes serious physical injury to a companion animal. So aggravated cruelty means the act was intended to cause extreme pain or carried out in a depraved manner, and this carries a harsher penalty in the eyes of the law. So horses may not be able to fit into that companion animal category currently, but I believe it is our responsibility to keep reminding humans that horses actually, they are companion animals. And then, you know, should it really matter if it's a companion animal or not? If you're causing extreme pain in a depraved manner to an animal, I mean, th does it matter whether they come in your house or they don't? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that's our responsibility is to keep trying to maybe change this law so it, you know, removes the companion animal part of it, you know. Um, and makes it very clear that this applies to any, any mammal. Why not? Or maybe beyond mammal, I, any animal, I should say. Um, section 355 talks about abandonment of animals, and this law prohibits a person being the owner or possessor or having charge or custody of an animal from abandoning such animal or leaving it to die in a public space. Um, there's an, a later statute that covers abandonment if it's not in a public space but in a confined area. Um, the bottom line is that abandonment is illegal, okay, in, in the eyes of the law. Um, and it's our responsibility to remind horse owners that uh, abandonment is not just immoral, but it's illegal, you know. So it's not just something you may want or not want to do, but in the, even in the eyes of the law, you know, this is against the law. It's criminal. Section 356 uh, was, uh, talks about failure to provide proper food and drink to impounded animals. So this kind of talks about, uh, uh, this pertains to the impounded confined animals as opposed to the ones in public space. Um, if a person refuses or neglects to supply to such an animal during its confinement um, a sufficient supply of good, and I, I quoted this, a good and wholesome air, uh, whatever that means, food, shelter, and water, are guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, this section outlines a sustenance to be provided on a 12-hour schedule. So in the law, it talks about if it's not, the animal's not getting food or water in a 12-hour time frame, then it's not getting proper care. Um, 
So that's a little less vague than just sustenance alone, right? Because it talks about a time frame. Um, so I, you know, it, again, it's another step in the right direction in terms of really outlining what we are allowed or not allowed to do. And I just consider this abandonment in a non-public space, so it's basically a corollary to the Section 355 that I just talked about. Selling or offering to sell or exposing diseased animals. Um, uh, this, this section prohibits the sale or offer to sell of horses with glanders, which is a disease we don't really have in this country anymore, um, but, uh, or other contagious or infectious diseases dangerous to the life or health of human beings or animals. And uh, so I'm assuming this law is quite old, the fact that it, it, it specifically mentions glanders but nothing else. Um, and uh, so this section is probably designed more to protect the human consumer, um, but inevitably it should just decrease the possible exposure of diseased horses to other horses. So even though it was probably intended to help people, you know, protect people from buying sick, or sick horses, um, if we're not intermingling sick horses, I think that helps horses. Um, this is a, another good argument against auctions, um, where clearly infectious horses pass through on a regular basis. Um, there have been many diseases recently in the news. Um, one is uh, the herpes virus that can be devastating to a stable, a showgrounds, or a racetrack. Um, a few years ago, uh, down in Wellington, um, uh, veterinarians, owners, and trainers uh, held their breath uh, any time a horse got a fever as the herpes virus killed one horse after another right down the shed row. I mean, it was, you know, you, you could watch them pop fevers one next to the next to the next to the next. And, um, you know, while it's not common, um, you know, it is our responsibility to take sick horses really seriously and not unnecessarily expose, he expose healthy animals to unhealthy ones. And that seems really basic, but when people are competing for money or trying to sell a horse or there's a financial um, initiative, then they lose their head when it comes to taking care of their animals anymore. And so this is good that it's actually in the law saying, listen, we believe strongly enough that you shouldn't intermingle sick horses that we're going we're gonna to make a law out of it. Um, you know, so when horses share water buckets, hoses, manure forks, and pastures, they share disease too, you know. So I think it's a good thing um, for everyone to keep in mind, and it's a responsibility of mine as a veterinarian when I go onto my calls and I'm, I'm dealing with a sick horse, that I remind, in a, especially in a boarding situation where there's many owners and, and many horses, that, they, that you need to take some precautions to try to isolate this horse from the other ones. And uh, especially when you start moving that horse out of that population into auction populations or into show populations or into populations of, of hundreds or thousands of other you know, supposedly healthy animals. Um, Section 358 is selling disabled horses, um, and so it shall be unlawful for any person holding an auctioneer's license to knowingly receive or offer to sell or offer for sale any horse which by reason of debility, disease, or lameness, or for any other cause could not be worked in this state without violating the laws against cruelty to animals. So I, I was a little embarrassed to say that I, I wasn't aware of aware of this law, and I would think that's something I should know. Um, the problem is that this, you know, this, this forcing this law is not very easy, um, and there's, you know, the, the horse police aren't running around, you know, trying to, trying to make sure everyone abides by this. Um, but, you know, I don't go to auctions, but I'll gladly remind any of my clients that I think do or I know do. Um, of this law yeah, so that they can be aware and you know maybe if this law did get enforced once in a while it might have an impact on these auctions too. Uh, live animals as prizes uh, are prohibited. So this section prohibits using animals as prizes. Um, there is a little clause in there that allows for purebred livestock to be used as prizes which you know again it's um, I don't understand why they're different, but um, in any event, they've made this exception. Um, so since horses are included in their definition of livestock, um, they are potentially, um, you know, there's an opportunity that they might be, get used as a prize. But I think you, you might have some issues when you start talking about um, 
uh, regarding purebred, like what is a purebred, what does that mean? You know, it may create some questions there. Um, I do have a client, I have one client that I know of um, that won a horse as a prize at a fair. And, uh, you know, and I do believe it's a, a purebred um, and she's given it a great home, but, you know, I can't think of a worse idea than to give away a living creature like a stuffed animal, you know, at the carnival and have any expectations that it will receive the care or the respect that it deserves. You know, if you're giving away things for free, I mean, how can it possibly mean the same thing? Um, so, in uh, carrying an animal in a cruel manner. Um, so this, uh, a person who carries or causes it to be carried in or upon a vessel or vehicle in a cruel or inhumane manner will be guilty of a misdemeanor. So anyone, yeah, I hear the laughter because, again, this comes down to enforcement. But anyone in charge of transporting horses, sheep, cattle, or swine who confines these animals to a vessel must not confine them for longer than 28 hours consecutively. They can do it for 36 hours if they have consent of the owner without unloading for rest, water, or feeding. And, um, you know, it, and one of the reasons this is difficult to enforce is because it's hard to drive 28 hours and still be in New York State. You know what I mean? If you're not <laughs> you know, on the trailer, you're, you know, so try proving it, you know. And so that's where this stuff gets tricky, I think. I mean, that's part of it. Um, but I do think it's important for horse owners to discuss very clearly with their shippers what route, how many stops the shippers will be making with their horses. Because I deal with horses that obviously aren't just going to slaughter, thank God. I've got, you know, horses that are going to Florida, they're going to California, they're going to Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not unheard of for my clients to tell me that it took their shipper 48 hours to bring a horse back from Florida. And there's no way that should take 48 hours to come back from Florida, you know. And so I think it's important that... We keep that in mind that we hand our animals over to quote unquote professionals um, and we expect that they're going to do the right thing and they may be breaking the law, you know. And so, um, and so again, it's important enough that it's in the, it's a law. And so I thought that was interesting that, you know, um, obviously this makes total sense to me. You need to get the animals off and give them food and water and give them a break. Um, but I'm not the only one here. New York State agrees. Um, 359A. So this is a rule that a law that has is specific for horses. So every vehicle utilized to transport more than six horses must meet the following requirements. And there's it's a it's a it's quite a big list. So the interior of the compartment must be constructed of smooth materials containing no sharp objects or protrusions which are hazardous. The floors should be abrasive to prevent horses from skidding or sliding. Um, there should be sufficient apertures to ensure adequate ventilation. There shall be sufficient insulation to maintain adequate temperature. I'm assuming either way, right? Hot or cold. Um, sturdy partitions shall be in place not more than 10 feet apart if that vehicle doesn't have sections already or stalls already. Um, so 359A continued says, the doorways must be of sufficient height to allow safe ingress and egress of each horse contained in that compartment. Each compartment must be of sufficient height above the pole and the withers of each horse in the compartment. Ramps sufficient for loading are required if the height of the step up is greater than 15 inches. I know I've seen lots of trailers that are a lot more than 15 inches off the ground with no ramp whatsoever. Um, there should be two doors for ingress and egress which shall not be on the same side. And the reason for this rule is because if a trailer turns over, you still need to get those horses off. And if it's on the side with two doors, you know, you're out of luck. Um, and there shall be no more than one tier. Um, and again, so this was another law I wasn't totally aware of. I, I was aware of some of these rules or parts of this law, but I wasn't aware of all of them. And I know I have clients, puppies, you know, certain disciplines where they will shove horses in head to tail, head to tail, head to tail. In, uh, in stock trailers to move as many as they can at once. And it's more than 10 feet. Um, and, uh, and there was a really bad accident on the Northway um, like five or six years ago, and they lost the majority of the horses in that stock trailer because um, uh, the, uh, the truck tire blew and, he, and the driver lost control. And I don't know that it would have turned out any different, but I question whether that tire would have blown if there weren't 15 horses on that trailer. You know, who knows? But it doesn't... You know, it doesn't make any sense um, to put horses at risk like that and drive down the road at 80 miles an hour. 
and yeah, so a lot of stock trailers would violate this. Any stock trailer longer than 10 feet with no partition is in violation in New York. Po poisoning of animals, section 360. Um, a person may not unjustifiably, unjustifiably again, administer poisonous or, no or a noxious drug or substance to a horse, whether the horse is their property of him or herself or another. Um, uh, and for me, this is a medical concern because as veterinarians, we way too often sell drugs in bulk to our customers, and I'm guilty of, of this type of thing as well. Um, it is not uncommon for horse owners to have their own stash of antibiotics, tranquilizers, hormones, etc. Um, and not only can these drugs be noxious and poison in the wrong dose, but we are also contributing to drug resistances, you know, when we think every horse with a fever needs antibiotics. It's the same thing in humans. You get a fever, you think you need to have antibiotics, and, and just, just a reminder, antibiotics don't work on viruses, and most of us catch viruses most of the time. So this idea that everyone needs antibiotics, it, it, it's dangerous because when we get to the point where even the bacteria don't respond to antibiotics anymore, we're going to be in real trouble. We think, oh, oh, the war on terror is bad? Well, the war on microbes will be way worse. Um, and I think it is every veterinarian's responsibility to carefully govern their drug dispensing and the horse owner's responsibility not to try to be their own doctor all the time and have their own stash of stuff that they use, you know, you know incorrectly. Uh, so I go back to this case. Um, so when this equine tooth floater gave that uh, sedative, um, you know, she, she was, and the normal drug, the drug that we normally use all the time, became a poison in that situation. So, you know, there may be multiple laws that she was breaking at that time. Interference with or injury to certain domestic animals. Um, a person may not willfully interfere with, injure, destroy, or tamper with any horse, mule, dog, or any other domestic animal used for the purposes of racing, breeding, or competitive exhibition of skill, whether it is their property of him or herself, him or herself or another. And so again, I think this is probably designed uh, to help keep uh, racing and competing fair for the public, especially when they're betting. Um, but it's a good reminder that it's not just a matter of being fair, it's, it's a law. They've gone so far as to make it a law. Um, throwing a substance injurious to animals in public place, section 362. A person may not willfully throw, drop, or place glass, nails, pieces of metal, or other substances, substances which may wound or disable an animal. Um, this law is probably a throwback to when we had a lot more horses and buggies running around on public roads. But having said that, um, that this is how I lost my first horse, was to a nail in the foot. And uh, so now my responsibility is that I take every penetrating hoof and foot wound very, very seriously. Um, and, I, and I take any work around the farm very seriously. Uh, you know, if a fence is getting repaired or the roof is being repaired, I want to know how many nails they started with and how many, used, how many they used. And, and they won't come back if they don't keep track of that stuff for me. Um, Section 601, leaving a scene of an injury to certain animals without reporting. And again, this is another one that I was not really aware of, I think. Um, any person operating a motor vehicle which shall strike and injure any horse, dog, cat, or animal classified as cattle shall stop and endeavor to locate the owner or custodian of such animal or a police officer. Um, that person must take any other reasonable and appropriate action so that the animal may have necessary attention. Um, so yeah, I wasn't aware of this one, and of course it makes total sense. I think everyone in this room would do that without even being told that it was a law. Um, and I also think this law is good because it, it does um, start, it puts together horses, dogs, cats, and cattle. It's not trying to isolate one a, a companion animal from a livestock. Um, and it recognizing that the different species all deserve necessary attention. Now, it'd be nice if it just said animal, you know, but, um, you know, at least it's a start. Um, and I think it's, it's laws like this that start to bridge the gap, you know, between companion animals and livestock.
Um, section 368 is, uh, talks about operating on tails of horses. Um, a person may not cut the bone, uh, tissues, muscles, or tendons of the tail of any horse in any manner for the purpose uh, or with the effect of docking, setting, or otherwise altering the natural carriage of the tail. Uh, a person may not show or exhibit at any horse show or other like exhibition a horse uh, the tail of which has been cut or operated upon in the manner referred to it above. Um, so, you know, obviously I believe this is incredibly selfish and cruel to take away the horse's ability to control its tail. Um, you know, and luckily we don't, I don't really see this that a, anymore. Um, but the fact that it has had to become a law suggests that people, you know, wouldn't comply on their own and, you know, they were doing this to their, to their own animals. Uh, section 374 is humane destruction or other disposition of animals lost, strayed, homeless, abandoned, or improperly confined or kept. Um, and this, I think these next couple sections um, kind of lead into uh, a little bit of our discussion. And it says that uh, any authorized individual, police officer, animal control officer, officer of an incorporated humane society, some of the wording gets kind of weird. I don't know who had input on it, but... Um, may cause to be humanely destroyed um, any animal found abandoned or uh, and not properly cared for if upon examination by a licensed veterinarian or two reputable citizens, whatever that means, um, they find that the animal is so maimed, diseased, disabled, or infirm so as to be unfit for any purpose um, in that humane euthanasia is warranted. Okay, so Again, I'm not sure who put that law together with some weird language. Um, and, the, and it says, euthanasia may only be performed by means of injection of sodium pentobarbital, which are chemical euthanasia, uh, euth uh, or humane euthanasia. Uh, euthanasia by intracardiac injection or cardiac stick shall be performed only on animals that are heavily sedated, anesthetized, or comatose. And the only time you would want to do a heart stick would be because you can't get access to the, the bloodstream in any other way. The, you know, the veins are collapsed, you know, and you want to put the animal to sleep very quickly without, without drawing it out any further. Uh, so Section 374 continued. Um, any method of euthanasia other than uh, sodium pentobarbital injection is prohibited except that euthanasia by a gunshot is permissible as an emergency measure for an animal that is posing an imminent threat or serious physical, uh, of serious physical injury to people or other animals. Okay, so the only time you can you know, use the gun is if it's attacking a human or another animal. Um, and I, I know that, that this is not enforced, um, but the state goes so far to say this. Um, and I think it's very interesting from the slaughter standpoint. If the state of New York believes that chemical euthanasia is the only humane way to put an animal to death, isn't that a clear statement to the New York Farm Bureau that slaughter is therefore inhumane? I would have thought. What do I know? Um, disposal of, of dead animals. Okay, the carcass of large domestic animals, including horses, cows, sheep, swine, goats, and mules, shall be buried at least three feet below the surface. And I'm really paraphrasing on this one. There's a lot more to this section, but it got really boring. Um, <laughs> and um, such disposal shall be completed within 72 hours. Um, and there's probably also, this is a, these are state laws by the ag and markets, so I'm sure there are local ordinance which may also govern the control of disposal of large domestic animals. Um, and I believe that it, you know, we have a responsibility to revisit large animal disposal options. Um, disposal of horses is an additional cost when a responsible owner is trying to euthanize their horse. So finding cost-effective disposal techniques will help steer individuals away from slaughter. Uh, so three, uh, section 377 continued. Um, this I found... Um, as a PDF online, and it's Cornell's Waste Management Institute um, has an, an article that says, um, let's see, and so again, this will this will vary from state to state and, and potentially from ordinance to ordinance. But so the, one of the ways it says of disposing dead animals is burial, which we just talked about. Another way is rendering. This is an option in some areas where rendering services are are available. Um, apparently the rules have gotten stricter on rendering plants and they may be, there may be issues with drugs like antibiotics, dewormers, euthanasia solution. Um, 
uh, of course there's cremation. Uh, it's typically expensive, but it's a great option for someone who boards their horse and doesn't have a burial option. People that don't have a room at their own home or farm to bury an, an animal of that size. Um, the next option they listed was landfilling. Um, while, you know, while not someplace people, you know, want to envision their best friend ending up, some landfills have options for this. And, um, and to me, I don't know, it almost sounds a little easier than the rendering landfilling to me, but, you know, that's probably a very individual thing. Um, so, uh, but that may be an option in, in some landfills. Um, and then another one, which is, is getting a little more attention recently, is composting. Um, it's a possible avenue that we could develop more. Um, it is an import, it's important um, that composting areas are safe from wild animals, um, but it's a very, you know, quote unquote, natural approach. And it's basically an accelerated way of breaking down you know, the animal so that it can return to the earth. Oops. And then before I go to the next slide, there was one other, I'm trying to think of, um, I was talking to a veterinarian from Colorado really recently, like this week, um, and uh, I, I need to do some research on it because I haven't had a chance to, but they said in Colorado at the university for their pathology department, which is the department that does all the aut autopsies on animals, which are called necropsies, um, after they were done, they would go into, they had, if, trying to have a, say it in a way that's not really weird, but a, basically a, some sort of chemical broth and that would um, degrade the carcasses down very, very quickly. And um, the person didn't know like, what the byproducts of the process were. They didn't really know any of the details other than they remember at vet school this, this tank. Um, and so I wonder how many, there, there may be options out there that, that are you know, being used already that may be affordable or acceptable in some way or another um, that I think we could be. some more research may be, may be worth going in in that direction. Um, so section 377A, spaying and neutering of dogs and cats. So this obviously isn't about horses, um, but it, it's, a, it's a law that recognizes um, a serious overpopulation problem in dogs and cats. And so it talks about um, no animal shelter, pound, dog control officer, humane society, dog or cat protective association, or duly incorporated society for the prevention of cruelty to animals shall release any dog or cat for adoption to any person unless the dog or cat is spayed or neutered or the person intending to adopt has executed a written agreement with the animal shelter, et cetera, to get the animal spayed or neutered. So basically it's saying that if it goes through, you know, the 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 shelter pound process that it, if it gets released it should be fixed or you know there's some sort of agreement that the person getting the animal is going to do that. I would prefer the there's no agreement part they just get it done and then it goes but you know finances are always an issue. Um, so spaying and neuter. So while this law doesn't apply directly to horses it doesn't apply to them at all right now um, but it's a good point to jump from simple state laws to the human responsibilities. Um, you know, it is true that horses do not reproduce like rabbits, you know, or cats or dogs, luckily. Um, they typically produce one offspring per year. It's an 11-month cycle. Um, so why then do we have this population problem with horses? And it's, it simply comes down to the fact that humans create this problem with, with overbreeding. Humans are making too many horses. Um, the New York Thoroughbred Breeding and Development Fund, this is on the website, this is stuff I made up, so and it's on the front page, like you don't even have to search for this stuff. Um, making breeding and racing a vital force in New York State's economy. And it says the program distributes over $52 million, $52 million a year in the form of incentives, breeders awards, stallion awards, owner awards, purse money for New York bred horses. It's a lot of money. Um, There, did I go forward? Yeah. There are no state laws attempting to control the sequel and pop overpopulation. In fact, these organizations are encouraging and par partially financing the continued growth of equine population. So, you know, up until now, the breeders 
of these excess horses have had a convenient dumping ground, you know, which has been the auction houses and the slaughter plants. So when will the breeder's responsibility become a right of the horse? What about the retirement program they have for all these horses that are they're breeding? In 2011, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation raised $2,506,055 in total support and revenue. And again, it's they've got their they've got the profit and loss statement right there online. And while that's not the only thoroughbred retirement organization, it's one of the largest ones, and it's not just for New York breads. So this is a number that you know, you know, maybe nationwide. And we were talking about 52 million, you know, just in the New York bread um, incentive program. So there seems to be a lot more emphasis on breeding the horses than taking care of them. Um, and it's irresponsible to breed horses, race them for less than a quarter of their life and then expect someone else to take care of them for the next three quarters of their lives. And this isn't just racing. I'm picking on racing because it's easy to get this information, you know, um, and they admit to it. So there it is, you know. Um, and until the breeding and racing organizations take a hard look at the equine population problem, there will continue to be inconvenient horses left behind for everyone else to deal with. So what about spaying and neutering? You know, is it time that the state addresses this issue of overpopulation of horses like it has for small animals? You know, or, or can the breeding organizations take steps to reduce the sheer numbers of horses being produced? Um, would an increase in registration fees help stem reproduction and at the same time generate more revenue for those retirement programs? Um, the responsibility of equine overpopulation lays directly on the shoulders of humans. Uh, if, this, if, these, if these groups and individuals producing these horses are not held responsible for the overpopulation issue, it will never end regardless of how many horses get euthanized or go to slaughter in other countries. So what about the population problem that we have now, even if we fixed all the breeding problems, even if they stopped that, you know, even if we curbed the breeding problem today, we still have a population of horses to deal with. So horsemen, I believe horseman placement is the key. Finding the right job and home for the horses gives a better assurance of their welfare. Like I said, horses that are doing something for a living, they seem to get, you know, in my, in, you know, in the horses I see, they seem to get better care for a longer period of time. Um, horses that are on the racetracks need to be trained in place before they break down, before they're too injured to go and do something different for a living. Um, horses that are not competitive in whatever discipline they compete should be evaluated for their valuable skills that they do have. So with, not just racing, but jumping or dressage or barrel racing, whatever that job might be, um, if they're not working out in that discipline, there may be other valuable skills that that horse has. Sometimes their skills is just that they're quiet and sweet, okay? Maybe they, maybe they can't pee off or massage, but they're the sweetest horse you've ever met. You know, and they have a lot of value. I've got news for you. Um, they can make a great beginner horse, they can make a therapeutic riding horse, or they can make that horse that you, is just happy to see you every day. Um, you know, they, these horses don't always have to be perfectly sound to do some of these jobs. A lot of these jobs that they do, you know, they, you know, they, they, they may have a little bit of creakiness here or there, but, but they can still do a lot more than that. Um, and a horse that does not jump may be perfectly happy doing dressage. And most of the time, you know, one can find at least one valuable skill in each horse if you just take the time and look. And if you don't have 6,000 horses that you're looking at, you know. So human responsibility doesn't end when your horse is not useful to you anymore. Uh, you know, taking on a guardianship of an animal is a lifelong task, not a fair weather stint. Uh, we have made it too easy in the past for owners and trainers to dispose of horses when the horse does not suit them anymore. Auctions and slaughterhouses have directly enabled this activity. So we must take advantage of the closing of the slaughter plants to hold these owners' feet to the fire and demand that they contribute to the resolution. The owners won't like it, and the breeding organizations won't like it, the racing industry won't like it. You know, but of course they won't be able to tolerate the bad press if they do nothing about it. So we have to be the ones providing the bad press. <laughs> and you know, we have to be the voice for the horses without homes because their owners can't be bothered to take care of them anymore. So what about the last resort? Um, Susan mentioned the last resort just before I came up here. And, uh, 
and I like to think of it that way. And so for horses that have no home, no one to support them, and, and are looking at inevitable inevitability of shipping out of the country to slaughter, we have to consider and encourage the humane euthanasia. Um, I call it the last resort because I feel that it is an abused option for animals. I, I believe that euthanasia is even too easy sometimes. Um, so I don't like to I don't like to use it um, willy nilly, um, and I don't think anyone should. Um, just because your daughter goes off to college and no longer rides, this is not an excuse for killing a horse. Um, just because your your horse is now 22 years old and it's a little too creaky to be competed or ridden anymore, that's not an excuse for killing a horse. Horses do get older, and just like humans, they need more help along the way. So what are acceptable reasons for euthanasia? And again, this is my opinion, um, but you know, usually I'm right, so I think this is okay. <laughs> um, Probably the most common reason for euthanasia is colic that I, that I, that I see. Um, and an intestinal event that will not resolve without surgery in a horse that is uh, too unhealthy for surgery or the owners can't afford surgery. I don't hold it against someone if they can't afford to go to colic surgery. And to be honest, if a horse colics and die, you know, is going to die from colic, that's a very natural situation to me. So you know, if someone can't afford surgery, I get that. You know? but, let's euthanize them if they're not going to take that step instead of letting them suffer to death. Um, the, I would say the second most common reason that I see for euthanasia is persistent severe lameness. Mm -hmm. So why persistent, right? Well, an abscess will make a horse grade four out of five or five out of five temporary, okay? It's not a big deal. The lameness has to be grade four out of five or five out of five with little chance of improvement in my opinion. And just to be clear, grade one out of five is a lameness noticeable at the trot only intermittently. A grade two out of five lameness is a lameness at the trot that you see consistently at the trot. Grade three out of five is a lameness slightly noticeable at the walk. Grade four out of five is a lameness obvious at the walk. And then grade five out of five is a non-weight bearing, so the horse won't put any weight on the limb, just so we're clear about what I'm talking about with these numbers. Um, you know, many horses can live long and healthy lives with, the, with a persistent grade one, two, or even a three lameness. So what are acceptable reasons for euthanasia still? Being skinny, okay, no, that's not a reason to put an animal to sleep, okay? Being skinny is not a disease. It might be a symptom of a disease, okay, so it can, you know, it, but it can also be a natural, part of the natural aging process of older horses as they lose muscle mass and their digestive tracts become less and less absorptive. Weight loss is definitely a condition worth pursuing as a possible disease symptom, but in itself it's not an excuse for euthanasia. I hear that oftentimes, oh, we almost put this horse to sleep when a guy was a bag of bones. Well, well, I don't care if it's a bag of bones. Like, you don't feed me for a year and I will be a bag of bones, but I don't think that's a good reason to kill me. Okay? <laughs> um, Neurologic conditions, uh, another possible reason. Horses that lose control of their balance and have trouble getting up and down are a danger to themselves and to humans. Okay, that's another reason that we see horses that um, have to get euthanized. Um, difficulty standing up is a common problem for older horses. So whether it is from chronic lameness, weakness, or a neurological condition, a horse cannot survive recumbent or lying down. Horses can't stay down for hours and hours and hours. They will develop a, you know, a whole host of other medical conditions. Um, how about unable to eat hay anymore? No, nope, that's not a good one. Um, there have been incredible strides in equine nutrition in the last 10 years, and you know, horses with very few teeth can survive on senior feeds and processed hay feed stuffs. You know, I have a lot of horses in my practice that have, you know, essentially, they have teeth, but they don't have any teeth that oppose each other, you know. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, and, you know, it's a problem in that they can't chew the vegetation very well anymore, but they, they still do very well with all the feeds that we have these days. Um, how about a horse that won't eat anything? Okay, that's a little trickier. You know, possibly a good reason to euthanize. But most of the time, if you dig hard enough diagnostically from a medical standpoint, or if you give a horse enough time, this can be resolved as well. Um, I know it's difficult to watch horses go through inappetence, um, but it happens in older, older humans all the time, you know? So um, 
it's not unique to horses that they can go through periods where they don't want to eat or they can't eat or nothing tastes good to them anymore. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily the end of the road. Um, how about cancer? Okay, if a horse has tumors that are impacting its comfort or its health, then this may be a suitable reason for euthanasia. But having said that, horses live with sarcoids, thyroid tumors, melanomas for many years before they start affecting their quality of life. And a lot of times, I put horses to sleep that have all those things, and that's not why they're getting put to sleep, okay? So there's, there's other reasons. So there's a, it, it, cancer, luckily, in horses is not a very common reason for putting them to sleep. Okay, so what about an acceptable reason like an owner can't afford their horse anymore? Um, this one's a tough one for me. You know, I know there are plenty of veterinarians that, you know, have no problem with this excuse. Um, but, you know, like I said earlier, my problem is I don't believe most people. And um, <laughs> maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Um, I don't like euthanizing a horse without a medical reason for it. Um, you know, I don't believe in convenience euthanasia. But sometimes, like I said earlier, if it's a situation between that and going off to slaughter, then you might be able to convince me, but you'll probably have to work at it. Um, so, but if I know a horse will go to slaughter um, and I don't euthanize it, then I feel humane euthanasia is better of, is better of the two evils, okay? Um, making euthanasia disposal an affordable alternative to slaughter will be a challenge, you know, as long as the slaughter exists. <laughs> Um, the slaughter of horses uh, disincentivizes people to provide, you know, what the state of New York considers the only way to humanely euthanize a horse, not just me. So, providing affordable euthanasia and disposal, you know, it's going to take a cooperative effort of veterinarians and a disposal plan to provide low-cost euthanasia. Um, I believe that the rate-limiting step will be the disposal part, meaning I think the disposal part will be the expensive part of the situation, uh, you know, of resolving that situation. Um, there will, I, I feel like there will always be veterinarians capable and interested in providing low-cost euthanasia for horses suffering or headed for slaughter. Um, the tricky piece of the puzzle will be to find out facilities willing to pick up and handle the disposal process. Um, you know, the costs of disposal may be curbed by doing multiple euthanasias at one time, and then you can coordinate those, you know, with disposal companies, things like that. But on the same token, it sounds very wrong to me to be coordinating multiple euthanasias, you know. So um, I write this, but I don't like what I'm writing sometimes. So, you know, horses have rights because humans have used their voice to establish those rights. Um, the voice of this summit has extended those rights by defunding horse slaughter plants in the United States. Uh, I feel like we must continue to use our voice to help horses from the start at breeding to the end of euthanasia in a humane and responsible manner. Um, thank you, Susan E. Point Advocates, for helping to be the voice of horses. Mm.